Hey, One Lit Teacher here to talk about how to identify poetic meter. So there are four common types of meter in English poetry that you just need to master. There is the iambic foot, which is actually the most common in English literature. It is a two-syllable foot, unaccented followed by accented, didum, as in I am, your man. There is a trochaic foot, also two syllables, and the opposite of iambic, dum d, as in tiger. And then there is an anapestic foot, which is three syllables, two unstressed, one stressed, d d dum, let us in, and the opposite, a three syllable dactylic foot, stressed, and then two unstressed, dum d d, victory. A unit of poetic meter is called a foot. So think about it as if maybe you're walking down the street and you have a poem or a song in your head, you're sort of internalizing that meter and that is the idea of poetic feet. And so to learn the number per line idea, you just need to memorize the Latin words that represent the number. So one foot is monometer, two is dimeter, three feet trimeter, four tetrameter, five pentameter, six hexameter, seven heptameter, eight octameter, and nine nonometer. So as I mentioned, the most common meter in English poetry is iambic meter, and it is sort of a mirror of the cadence of regular speech in English, the rise and fall of the syllables that we speak in normal language. And iamb is a unit of one unstressed and one stressed syllable. Poems in English literature are often composed in iambic meter, frequently iambic tetrameter or iambic pentameter. All sonnets, whether they're English Shakespearean or Petrarchan or Spenserian, all sonnets are written in iambic pentameter, that is five iams per line. And Shakespeare's very famous verse plays are all written in blank verse, which is unrhymed iambic pentameter. So on the right side, I have some famous examples. Wordsworth's I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud is iambic tetrameter. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or veils and hills. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. De dum 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 de dum. This is sort of giving us the idea of this sort of wandering or ambling outdoors among nature, which is what the poem is really about. And then in the middle, a, a famous example from the opening lines of Shakespeare's Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. De dum de dum de dum de dum de dum. This is classic iambic pentameter. And then at the very bottom, some very famous lines from the balcony scene of Romeo and Juliet, when Romeo says, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Again, this speech is unrhymed for the most part. And so it is called I, uh, blank verse, okay, iambic pentameter, unrhymed, blank verse. Here are some other examples. Dreams by Langston Hughes is one of my very favorite poems. In fact, I use this poem on my One Lit Teacher video about the process of color marking. This short poem really packs a punch. Here, it, I'm using it as an example of iambic dimeter because the poem is mostly written in iambic dimeter, but there's also some dactylic meter in the poem. Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. So I've highlighted the two different kinds of meter. Again, mostly iambic dimeter, two iams per line. But for example, in line three of each of the stanzas, that meter is interrupted or broken, which goes along with the idea of the poem. And in fact, even the line in the first stanza is broken. It is an example of a catalytic line where the last foot is incomplete. So we have the stress syllable for the third dactyl, but then there's no finish. This is sort of like if it were a, a song, these would be rests, okay? And in stanza two, we have a dactyl, a trochee, and then uh, an incomplete foot, which would most likely be another trochee. And if it were a song, there would be a rest there. On the right side, a uh, stanza from a very famous poem called My Papa's Waltz, another of my favorites. This one is really brilliant because the meter, which is iambic trimeter, mirrors the idea or the music of the poem, which is named in the title, My Papa's Waltz. We romped until the pans slid from the kitchen shelf. My mother's countenance 
could not unfrown itself. De dum de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum, and this is again a, a waltz idea in the poem. So sometimes meter really does um, go along with the meaning of the poem very closely. Here is a famous example of an Edgar Allan Poe poem. Most of us know the Raven, or at least the opening lines of the Raven. This one is written in uh, trochaic octameter, so it is eight trochees per line. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. So in line two, there are a couple of really interesting things happening. First of all, many a is a slur or a tie. Again, it's sort of a musical idea. Think of the poem as a song. And if you were playing it on an instrument, this would be a tie from one note to the next. And at the end of the line, if it were a song, we would have a rest. This is an incomplete foot or an example of catalexis. Here is a stanza from another very famous poem, another one of my favorites called Sympathy by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And this is an example of tetrameter in mixed meter. The two feet are iambic and anapestic and they are used in alternating ways. So the first and last lines of the stanza are iambic and then anapestic, and then the interior lines are the opposite. And it also creates a very musical feeling. I know what the caged bird feels, alas, when the sun is bright on the upland slopes, when the wind stirs soft through the springing grass, and the river flows like a stream of glass, and so on. And there is a music motif in the poem because the bird is singing or, or looking out beyond the bars into spring where um, he should be flying around and singing. And so um, again, the meter in this poem actually is very closely tied to the meaning of the poem. The last line is incomplete. Again, it would be where there would be a, a rest if it were a line in music. So to recap, there are four major types of meter in English poetry, iambic, trochaic, anapestic, and dactylic, the first two being two syllable feet, and the last two I mentioned being three. And there are a couple of ways to remember them. First of all, they are opposites of each other in pairs. Um, and also they actually make the pattern of at least one form of the word that they represent. So an I am is an I am, a trochee is a trochee, an anapest is an anapest, and then if you use the adjectival uh, form of dac, which is dactylic, you have a dactyl. Dactylic is dactylic, okay? Again, you'll just need to memorize those Latin number words. Down at the bottom of the slide, I put a little extra treat here. This is one example of a favorite lesson that I've done to help kids learn meter in high school. So it's called um, Meter Hopscotch, and I have drawn out around the room the first line of some of the poems that we are studying. So this is the first line of I wandered lonely as a cloud as hopscotch. So one foot is unaccented, two is accented, and so on. I wandered lonely as a cloud. And since this poem continues in that pattern, a student could then walk back around and do it again and go through the whole poem that way. And I really think that um, that sort of whole body experience response is a great way to internalize the meter. Another good way is to tap it out or to stomp it out or clap it out and really feel the music of the meter in poetry. I hope you love poetry as much as I do, and I hope that you'll subscribe to my YouTube channel, One Lit Teacher, to get some more lessons about poetry.